widespread destruction after a tornado outbreak in the south. More than 30 reported twisters across three states, killing at least seven people. Now more storms are taking aim, this time in the west. The bloody battle to take control of a key town in Ukraine. As his country fights to gain ground, a senior Ukraine defense advisor is here to tell us why this war is bigger than just Ukraine. President Biden facing growing questions over documents found at his former office and his home in Delaware. The congressional committee now launching its own investigation. Plus, the maximum fine is handed down to the Trump organization after being convicted of tax fraud. How much the organization will have to pay and what happens next. And dressed to impress, when NFL players want to look good for the cameras, there is one man many of them call. I truly believe no matter how bold the print, it can be pulled off when it's tailored perfectly. How he went from a career in finance to one of the most sought after stylists in the world. Good evening, I'm Phil Lipoff, and tonight for Lindsay Davis, thanks so much for streaming with us. It is a busy Friday night, and we are tracking several developing stories here at ABC News. Overseas in Ukraine, we are following the bloody battle for a town called Solidar. Russia has declared victory there, but Ukraine is denying that. Matt Gutman is standing by for us on the ground from Ukraine. But first, we begin with the deadly tornado outbreak here in the U.S., the South bearing the brunt this time from the ferocious storms that have been pounding the West for weeks. Central Alabama reeling tonight after an EF3 tornado touched down there. And the sad toll of this system is becoming pretty clear. At least nine deaths overall, seven are being blamed on that twister. And we take a look at the devastation from above in LaGrange, Georgia, which is just outside Atlanta tonight. Families are reeling from the damage. Steve Osinsami leads us off from just outside of Atlanta. More than 40 tornadoes have now been reported across seven states, including this one that tore through Selma, Alabama, where an initial damage survey tonight shows it was an EF2 with wind speeds of at least 111 miles an hour. They think the tornado that hit rural Otaga County minutes later was even stronger. This is what surviving the tornado looked like in Decatur, Alabama, where workers at a recycling facility took cover, and then a giant piece of metal came crashing down on an opening they couldn't close. At least nine people died in the storm in two states, including a five-year-old boy who was killed when his family's car was hit by a falling tree. The governors of both Georgia and Alabama have declared a state of emergency tonight, as many of their families are just now beginning to put their lives back together. Unfortunately, it's been a tragic night and morning in our state. As soon as the sun came up in Otaga County, Alabama, neighbors came out to help neighbors. Have you ever seen anything like this? Never. Never. On County Road 68, these are teachers and counselors from the middle school up the road who kept students safe during the storm. They're gonna bring a tarp. They were out today helping families pick up the pieces. So much damage. This will be our weekend for sure, probably part of next week also. Yeah. It's gonna take a while to get all of this taken care of. The community center is collecting supplies. Yeah. Um, Boone's Chapel is feeding volunteers. Yeah. We're gonna take care of our people. So many communities begin to take care of each other after devastating storms like this. Steve joins us now. Steve, how likely is it people will be able to get back into what's left of their homes? Well, people are already sort of sifting through, you know, what they have left of their homes. This one, for example, is a home that belongs to an older woman who survived. She's not able to stay here tonight, though, because there's no power to this home. And of course, it's not really livable. So many people, though, have to first, of course, call FEMA. They have to call their insurance agents. Uh, they need help drying things out if their homes are livable. For many families, we're talking about weeks, but in some cases, we could be talking about months or years before people are actually able to truly get back into their homes just because of the various states of condition that some of these homes in, are in. And I want you to take a look around me and see this one. You know, this actually isn't even the worst of the worst. It looks like it's lost, you know, part of its roof. You see that, you know, the front of the home has 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 moved in, 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 in has fallen to the side here. But there are some homes that are complete and total losses. And so it's going to take those families a lot longer to rebuild. This here looks 
looks like they will probably have to rebuild this home. And, and one other thing that we heard, Phil, from different uh, people today, they're very concerned about supply chain issues, how long it's going to take them to get contractors, much less how long it's going to take them to deal with their insurance companies. Phil? Yeah, it's a long, difficult road to recovery. Steve, thank you so much. As that system moves out, another one is arriving in the west, and then it's heading east. ABC senior meteorologist Rob Marciano is tracking it for us. Rob? Hey, Phil, you know, the, the system that brought these deadly tornadoes to Alabama and Georgia was actually on the West Coast earlier in the week, bringing them floods and mudslides. And you're right, this next one coming into California will probably do a similar track. This one's big. It's got the flood watches that have been expanded, not just across most of California. We've seen that now for weeks, but all the way down south of San Diego. So heavy rain coming into all to the, to the Golden State, but also wind and rain coming up and through Oregon and Washington. And then a strong piece of this southern energy gets over the mountains we'll see heavy snows not just in the sierras but likely in the inner mountain west as well and boy this time tomorrow night uh, san diego is really going to be getting clobbered and look how it holds together on monday morning into the midwest and then beyond that as it pushes all the way to the east coast but look at back to the california side of things another storm comes in monday morning that one's not too shabby either it's going to bring uh, several more inches of rainfall three to six plus total especially across Northern California and Central California. We've already seen this, the, the earth move and then the three to six feet of snow and a foot plus of snow in the Intermountain West, but three to six feet of more record setting snow in the Sierras. Uh, this is putting a nice dent in the drought. Uh, it's doing some damage while it does so, but look at the improvement we've seen uh, over the past few months. We went from extreme and exceptional drought to seeing none of that now in the last month, just some moderate drought in through parts of the Central uh, California coast. Now we really got to look at Utah and places like Colorado, get them to catch up and start to relieve some of that drought. But obviously getting it all at one time is, is not fun, Phil, and that's what's happening here. But the silver lining is we're seeing a, a nice uh, improvement, at least in California, in their drought. Yeah, nice to get something out of it. Rob, thank you so much. Overseas now to Ukraine, where Russia is declaring victory in the very bloody battle for the town of Solodar. Uh, victory there would be the first significant gain for Russia after retreating in recent months, but Ukrainian officials are denying that claim. ABC's Matt Gutman has more from Ukraine. Tonight, Russia making its strongest claim yet of controlling the town of Solodar in eastern Ukraine, the war's bloodiest battle. But Ukrainian soldiers still fighting inside the town, disputing that. Showing Russian soldiers amassing, then being targeted, a fireball, the result of a direct hit. Not in dispute, the destruction. The city of Bakhmut, now almost unrecognizable. Ukraine says this footage shows a drone zeroing in on Russian troops. They scurry inside the barn, that munition dropped, the barn exploding in a flash of flame and smoke. Ukraine claiming up to 20,000 Russian troops. Many of the mercenaries have been killed in the region. Ukraine hasn't made public its casualty figures. And perhaps in a sign of growing frustration with the war's progress, President Putin this week publicly scolding a senior minister, criticizing him for working too slowly on contracts for new aircraft. Matt joins me now. And Matt, those, those casualty numbers you're talking about are just horrifying. What does it mean if Russia takes this small town? It's unclear, Phil, right? Because on the one hand, the military value of Solidar is questionable, as is Russia's tactics here. They have thrown an enormous amount of resources at this city, and it may come at such a high cost. Uh, Ukraine is talking about uh, 10 up to 20,000 casualties on the Russian side, that it may prevent Russia from taking the main prize in the region, which is the city of Bakhmut, and that is that would give it the control of uh, part of eastern Ukraine. So right now, it's unclear clear what it actually means. What is unmistakable is the enormous toll on both sides. Phil. No, absolutely. Matt Gutman from Ukraine tonight. Matt, thank you. And I'm joined now by Ukraine Minister of Defense Advisor Yuri Sok. Mr. Sok, thanks so much for taking the time to be with us and to see you here in person. It's nice. Um, as we just heard from Matt Gutman's report, there are a lot of questions about the status of the fight uh, in the eastern towns of Solodar and Bakhmut. Uh, what can you tell us about the latest information that you have about the fights there? Um, Phil, thank you very much for inviting me. It's an honor. The situation in and around Solodar is really, really critical. The fighting is very intense. The 
fields around Solidar are littered with Russian corpses that are trying to gain control of the ruins of Solidar because this is essentially what they've turned the city into. Uh, General command, military command is in control and of course one thing I would like to stress is that uh, we unlike our enemy, have high regard for the life of our personnel. So we're not using our soldiers as cannon fodder for the meat grinder tactics. We are fighting a smart war, so we take decisions accordingly. The UK and Poland are looking into providing tanks to assist uh, in, in your effort uh, to fight the Russians. How urgent is it for Ukraine to get those modern heavy tanks? As I'm sure you know, Phil, the top priority for Ukraine continues to be the air defense systems because every day Ukraine is at the risk of another massive missile strike. And these missile strikes, they're destroying our energy infrastructure. Tanks are of course very, very important at this stage because tanks, we need tanks to be able to deoccupy all the temporarily occupied territories and we hope that allies on January 20th, which will be the meeting of the Rammstein format, we hope that the Allies will take that important political decision, will remove that one of the last remaining mental blocks, and Ukraine mm -hmm. will start receiving heavy tanks. And we are confident that the U.S. will show leadership in that. Can, can we talk about that for a minute? Because the United States has sent so much aid uh, to Ukraine, and you know, for the reason that your president has talked about, that it's not just about your country, it's, a, it's about democracy, um, you know, worldwide. But there seems to be, you call it a mental block, uh, th there seems to be this line that the United States, other allies, may not want to cross. At first it was the, it was the, the planes, the jets, yes. um, that we heard your president talk so much about that he desperately needs, now it's the tanks. Why do you think, with all of the the systems and the weapons and everything, all the aid that the United States has sent to Ukraine so far, why do you think there is a mental block? Do, do you think, I mean, we knew with the planes, it was, you know, President Putin said that's, you know, that would be all out war. Is that the fear? And at what point does that fear, in your opinion, have to be put aside? Well, first of all, I would like to thank the American people, um, the American taxpayers for the support that we have received so far. And it, it has been tremendous. Um, and as for these mental blocks, now, you see, a lot of the situations on the battlefield, uh, a lot of tragic situations, such as the Mariupol tragedy, the Bucha, uh, Severodonetsk, Lysychansk, now Solidar, Many of them could have been avoided if the aid, the military support that we receive, if it came a little bit sooner, a little bit earlier, right? So uh, as a coalition of good, because we are fighting the freedom war, right? It's a, it's a war not about some um, parts of Ukrainian territory. It's a war about our common values. So uh, the, the, the fear uh, which stops our allies perhaps from uh, being more proactive, which would be beneficial to Ukraine and to the world, uh, is based on, uh, uh, on a wrong understanding of you know, what Russia represents. It's a terrorist state, it's a bully state which understands raw force and we have shown to the world that every time that when we every time we use weapons uh, provided to us by the west we've crossed those lines so many times you know every time we do that the enemy retreats so courage is always stronger than fear and when you're fighting for common values you shouldn't be afraid of the enemy because the enemy retreats when he fears force along those lines there are some in this country who would say, we've sent billions of dollars, uh, we need to you know, hold back on some of that and fix the problems in this country. You've heard that, yes. um, and it, it, it continues. How, and I hear, I hear what you're saying, but how would you make some folks in this country who say, you know, it's too much, how would you make them understand that it's, as you say, it's more than just about Ukraine? This uh, perhaps comes to someone else's door next, a NATO ally, whoever. Well, absolutely. Look, uh, Russia's plans do not include just Ukraine. And we are not asking no country to fight for us. We are ready to do it ourselves for our freedom, for your freedom, for our common freedom. Now, at the same time, I'm sure that people understand that, you know, if Ukraine is not supported, if it's not possible, but in the scenario where Ukraine would lose this war, it would spread further west. And, you know, if it does spread further west, there will be no choice. So uh, 
Americans and all other European allies will have to fight it. So, in effect, uh, this the, is kind of like the front line of that fight. Absolutely, Ukraine is. absolutely. So we're just saying, look, give us the tools. We will finish the job. We are not asking for more. We are not asking you to fight for us. We'll do it ourselves. But give us tanks, give us air defense, give us fighter jets, and we will finish the job. We will stop this evil from spreading further west. Yuri Sok, thanks so much for taking the time to come in. I really appreciate it. It's nice to meet you, and you I hope much. your family and everyone you love inside Ukraine stay safe. We'll try. We'll try. Back here at home, growing questions about classified documents found in President Biden's former office and his home in Delaware, taking up a lot of oxygen in Washington, with two House committees now opening up investigations into the matter. ABC senior White House correspondent Mary Bruce with details. Today, amid the firestorm over his handling of classified documents, President Biden welcoming the Japanese prime minister to the White House. The two discussed strengthening Japan's military might, deepening military cooperation between the two countries to counter the rise of China. But the White House agenda now overshadowed by questions about those classified documents found at the president's former private office and in the garage of his Wilmington home. 24 hours after the attorney general appointed a special counsel to investigate, the president today repeatedly refusing to comment further. Are you confident you did nothing wrong, Mr. President? The White House making it clear they're done talking about it. The president takes uh, classified information, classified documents very seriously. I would refer you anything that is related to this, uh, to the, as it relates to the review to the Department of Justice or my colleagues at the White House counsel uh, office. And Mary joins us now. Mary, I'm wondering, does that answer we just saw there indicate how the White House is going to answer these questions moving forward? It's pretty clear that they're going to be tight-lipped while this investigation is underway. And in the meantime, they're facing growing scrutiny from Republicans on the Hill. The House Judiciary and Oversight Committees have now both launched investigations asking for all of the classified documents that were found and a list of who had access to them. Now, asked if they plan to comply with the committee's requests, the White House tonight is declining to comment for now. Phil? All right, Mary Bruce at the White House for us. Thank you. Thank you. Now to former President Donald Trump's legal troubles. A New York court has slapped his company, the Trump Organization, with the maximum penalty for a years-long scheme to evade taxes. ABC's Aaron Katursky has more. Tonight, the Trump Organization has been sentenced to the highest fine possible, $1.6 million, for what prosecutors called a multidimensional scheme to evade taxes. The victims of the public, the victims of the people of the state of New York, uh, and this kind of... Uh, pervasive fraud. The judge said it, we said it, and the jury found it. It's greed, pure and simple. The conviction stained former President Trump's namesake company as he runs again for the White House. For well over a decade, the jury found it paid executives off the books through luxuries like rent, car leases, and private school tuition. Former President Trump was never charged, but at sentencing, prosecutors said elements of the scheme were explicitly sanctioned from the top down. And at trial, jurors saw Trump's signature on checks and his initials on memos. The defense insisted Trump did not know about the scheme and in a statement called the former president a victim of politically motivated prosecutors. Aaron joins us now. And Aaron, I'm curious, does this complete the investigation into Trump's business practices or is there more to come? There may be more to come, Phil. The district attorney told us that this sentencing here at court closes one chapter of his ongoing criminal investigation of former President Trump. So that suggests there may yet be another chapter to write. In the meantime, the Trump Organization has two weeks to pay the fine, and the company says it is going to appeal its conviction. Phil? All right, Aaron Katursky, thank you. Meanwhile, the U.S. will begin to take, quote, extraordinary efforts to keep the country from defaulting on its debts as soon as next week. That's according to Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen. Yellen said a default on the country's debt would cause irreparable harm to the economy. Her words, in real terms, a default would mean the government couldn't make payments on millions of Americans for benefits like Social Security, Medicare, and military salaries. Your tax refunds could also be postponed. An economist warned millions of jobs could be lost. Top Democrat lawmakers are calling on Congress to move quickly to address the issue.
In Los Angeles, there are mounting questions tonight after the death of a teacher tased multiple times by police. New body camera video released by the LAPD shows officers restraining 31-year-old Keenan Anderson, then tasing him repeatedly following traffic collision on January 3rd. He died at the hospital hours after this. LAPD Chief Michael Moore said Anderson was acting, quote, erratic during an arrest and suffered a medical emergency. Preliminary blood tests revealed cannabis and cocaine in Anderson's system. Los Angeles police say it's unclear if being tased led to his death. They continue to investigate the incident. Anderson was the cousin of Black Lives Matter co-founder Patrice Cullors. Cullors is now blaming the LAPD for her cousin's death, saying he was pleading for help. Next, shock and sadness tonight after the sudden death of Lisa Marie Presley, the singer and only son of Elvis. ABC's Matt Rivers has more on her life and death. Tonight, the tributes pouring in outside Graceland for Lisa Marie Presley, the cherished daughter of rock and roll legend Elvis Presley. Engine 125 squad, 68th full arrest. Paramedics taking less than six minutes to respond to a call Thursday morning about an unresponsive woman in cardiac arrest at a home in Calabasas, California, then rushing the 54-year-old to the hospital where she died. Her grieving mother, Priscilla Presley, telling People Magazine, quote, it is with a heavy heart that I must share the devastating news that my beautiful daughter, Lisa Marie, has left us. She was the most passionate, strong, and loving woman I have ever known. At Graceland, the family's home in Memphis, Tennessee, fans honoring the singer and songwriter. We decided to stop here to live out a dream of my dad's, and the sad news broke. And I love you. Lisa Marie was at Graceland just last weekend, thanking visitors on what would have been Elvis's 88th birthday. It's just so moving how every year you come from all over the world, and it's, it's moving to me and my family, and thank you. Two days later, she was at the Golden Globes, appearing unsteady during an interview on the red carpet. I'm gonna grab your arm. She and her mother cheering as Austin Butler accepted the Best Actor Award for his portrayal of her father in the film Elvis. Tonight, actor Tom Hanks, who played Elvis's manager in the movie, posting to Instagram, we are heartbroken over the loss of Lisa Marie Presley, absolutely broken. Lisa Marie was just nine years old when Elvis died at the age of 42, later becoming sole heir of his estate as she embarked on her own music career. But like her father, she battled addiction for decades. Lisa Marie entering rehab several times, most recently in 2016, for prescription painkillers. I had bottom, like below bottom. From where I was to just from, it's pretty miraculous. Lisa Marie was married four times, most famously to pop megastar Michael Jackson. She was a proud mother to daughters Riley, Vivian, and Finley. In 2020, Lisa Marie's beloved son Benjamin dying by suicide at the age of 27. Lisa Marie then penning an essay last year about her grief over losing Benjamin, saying his death, quote, destroyed her family's life, adding, it's a real choice to keep going, one that I have to make every single day and one that is constantly challenging, to say the least, but I keep going for my girls. Yeah, we all remember that moment, how, how terribly heartbreaking it was. Matt Rivers joins us from Calabasas, California, where Lisa Marie Presley called home. But Matt, as you reported, she did make several visits to Graceland, where eventually she will be buried. Yeah, that is exactly right, Phil. She actually lived here behind me in this gated community in Calabasas, California, but a, con a representative for her daughter, Riley, confirms to ABC News that she will be buried at Graceland alongside her son, Benjamin. Phil. All right, Matt Rivers, thank you. When we come back, a dangerously close call. What saved a man from being inside of this car when it was hit by a rock slide? The self-taught stylist who's now dressing some of the biggest athletes in the NFL, his key to helping them pull off some of those flashy fits. But up next, turning pain into purpose, how a network of school shooting survivors is working together to find healing after tragedy. This is ABC News Live. The crushing of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news.
Get Ready America every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. Bring your friends. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's Bring how you start your, your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. So much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. Been a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. So, what's good to read? And we mean really good to read right now. Well, that's where Charlie and Kate Gibson can help. Join us for the new podcast series. It is called The Bookcase with Kate and Charlie. We will make sure you love what you read. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Ready for a good show? I'm Phil Gucci. The fireworks by Gucci. No matter how big, no matter how small, it is dangerous. It's not a paycheck. It's our life. Welcome back. Now to the terror that unfolded in a small community just outside Chicago last summer. It was a 4th of July parade meant to spread joy, but instead it brought horror. It was just one of hundreds of shootings last year alone. Now a network of gun violence survivors coming together to try to turn their pain into purpose. ABC's Byron Pitts with their story. driving right into the heart of downtown Holland Park. I can't look at it and not see the crime scene, the terror. For Lindsay Hartman, Independence Day will never be the same. I've come to this parade my entire life. And my daughter, Scarlett, was standing right here, dancing in the street, having the time of her life, when the first shots started to fire out. The Highland Park 4th of July shooting, one of more than 600 mass shootings this year. Lindsay, her husband, Danny, and their four-year-old daughter, Scarlett, were there when horror happened. Breaking news for you, a horrific scene unfolding. This is just outside of Chicago. I looked at my husband, and he looked at me and we just non-verbally knew that it was, we had to run for our lives. And I said, protect her. Don't worry about me. It will slow you down, just go. And it's still pretty raw. You know, there's a lot of emotions that are still very much at the surface. And like what? Fear, gratitude, terror. What did you lose that day, you think? The best way I can describe it is I don't feel safe in most places. So, you know, my world has just become a lot smaller because of my comfort zone. The family escaping physically unharmed, but mentally scarred. It just doesn't go away just because the camera crews and the headlines go away. I mean, it's something that sticks with you forever. As a gun violence survivor, Lindsay is certainly not alone. On average in this country, more than 115,000 people are shot by a gun every year. In the last 30 years, guns have claimed more than a million lives. 
But there are millions more like Lindsay who were shot at and survived, witnessed violence, or lost a loved one. Our stories are all uniquely different, but are bound together by a lot more commonalities than differences. My experience is America's experience. It is a profound public health crisis. We don't deal with the danger and the violence of gun violence the way we need to until it's at our door. We need to stop valuing guns more than we value human beings. Survivors across the country, part of a unique club they never asked to join, that's growing bigger every day, finding solace in one another and fighting for change. Craig isn't here to make new memories, and so this is all I have left of him. Valerie Burgess's 23-year-old son Craig was shot and killed nine years ago while buying chewing gum at a Chicago convenience store. His case still unsolved. This was actually taken the night that he was killed. He was a hooper, and he loved, loved, loved basketball. It's still hard all these years later. It will never be easy. Right after he was killed, I just I felt this need to scream, but I couldn't because I knew if I started screaming, I wouldn't be able to stop. So I held that scream in, and I still hold that scream in. Listening to you in this moment, I don't as much hear, hear survivor as I hear victim of an awful crime. No, I'm not a victim. But I have survived the most horrific thing that will probably ever happen to me. So yes, I'm a survivor. Valerie channeling her trauma into activism, joining the Every Town Survivor Network, an advocacy and support group for those touched by gun violence. The Survivor Network is compiled of thousands across the country, and they've had various gun violence uh, experiences with them, whether it's directly wounded, injured, had a loved one taken, it may have been threatened. Good morning, Lindsay. It's so good to see you. Valerie from the South Side and Lindsay from Highland Park met through this community. Relationships are powerful because you really don't have to explain yourself. Two women from different parts of Chicago, connecting through shared experience. Oh. Today, the two are meeting face to face for the first time. Hi. It's good to see you in person. I'm so glad to meet you. <laughs> what does she give? What do you get? I just really admire and look up to Val so much. So seeing sort of what down the line can look like mm. certainly is, is really valuable. I think the first time we talked, she was really emotional, and you could see mm. how that day had impacted her life. And she was like, I'm sorry. I'm like, no, no, no. You don't ever apologize for your feelings. You feel what you feel, and that day upended your world. Val buried a son, and that is unimaginable. That is the worst kind of pain for any parent. But she never looks at me and says, your pain is less. Val and Lindsay's healing journey together just beginning. <laughs> yeah. While another duo... Um, yeah, Jackie and I, I, I think we have fully adopted each other. And ...has been supporting each other for years. Way. Pastor Jackie Jackson and psychologist Doreen Dodge and McGee met through the Survivor Network four years ago. I took some food off of Jackie's plate when we were at a meeting together. She just reached over. No conversation. Not That's yet. a bridge too far. She isn't just it? reached over and took it, and I said, hold up. It would be my family to take food off my plate. And she said, well, I guess we'll just have to adopt each other. And we did. And we did. <laughs> These days, the pair consider each other siblings. Jackie first felt the sting of a bullet when he was a 10-year-old boy in Ohio. Do you still have the scar? I do. This was the entry room, and you could kind of see where it was stitched. Somehow it passed through, and it didn't break a bone at all. This trauma is sadly a constant in his life. I've had eight family members whose lives have been taken by gun violence. Eight of your eight. relatives shot and killed. And I just gave you in the last nine years. Doreen's sister-in-law and three young nieces were gunned down by her estranged brother-in-law 27 years ago in Oregon. <laughs> I hardly ever talk about this. Um, so he shot his way in, and um, that pushed them all to the front yard. 
Um, my mother-in-law, as far as I know, was holding one of the girls. So Sarah was five years old, Rachel was three years old, and April was five months old. Uh, I noticed as you told your story that uh, Jackie put his hand at your back. I guess that was part pastor, but it also seemed like part friend, part brother. Absolutely. Yeah. Today, the tour are in Washington, D.C. at the Gun Violence Memorial. Each glass brick here honoring a loved one. All of this is one family. <gasps> oh, oh. Those 700 bricks represent the, the 700 people killed each week. But those 700 bricks don't acknowledge, and we need to acknowledge, the thousands who are shot and wounded uh, or threatened with a gun. This is actually a vow of some of his ashes. Both and Jackie and Doreen's loved ones are memorialized oh, here. Rachel loved everything sparkly, and so these are some of her hair things, and she was actually wearing this that day, and it's something that I was able to get back that was really meaningful. All of these individuals, from the babies to the adults, these are people who, their lives, they're not statistics. Jackie and Doreen have grown so close, even spending time with one another's families. It has been an important part of my growth, being able to have fun. Fun? I didn't expect to hear that word in this conversation. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah okay, we have a ball. <laughs> we do, we do. Why is that important? It is so important because the world is so heavy when this is your reality. The 1900 census. Back in Chicago, Lindsay and Valerie break bread with other gun violence survivors. Do you ever think, man, I, I just I just want to get away from the heaviness, Absolutely. therefore I don't want to be a part yes. of this group? Yes, yes, yes. yes. we do. Yes. Yes. We do. Yes. But we have a purpose to, you know, bring out awareness and prevention and let people know that gun violence is not normal. We're in this club, but we, we managed to find space in this club for each other mm. and ourselves. Every town survivor network, and I say this unequivocally, saved my life. Together, hoping and fighting to save the lives of others. Our thanks to Byron for that. Still ahead here on Prime, the legal fallout for actor Kevin Spacey as he faces more allegations. Do at-home laser hair removal products really work? Becky Worley and the team put them to test, put them to the test. And are we alone in the universe? It's a question we've been trying to answer forever. We're gonna take a look at the Defense Department's records on UFO sightings by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day, this heartfelt message from Yoko Ono, celebrating the life of Lisa Marie Presley. Ono writing, quote, our hearts are with you. Love, Yoko. We'll be right back. at stake. So much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is where I belong. This is home. Real dirt in the sunlight again. I'm very excited. Anything could happen at any moment. My heart is so happy right now. We're making magic. We're today. making magic. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Come out, come out, wherever you are. I think my niece, Allie, was pushed off that ledge. And only one person came into an eight-figure sum as a result of her death. If we pull this off, we're set for life. What do you think you're doing? Get out, now. Can this be our little secret? They have to pay for what they did. The Watchful Eye, January 30th on Freeform and stream on Hulu. Zoo! 200! Oh, 200! 200 episodes of Dr. Pole. Oh. Music to my ears. It's been 10 years, and I'm still having fun. <laughs> that rocks. We do the dance of joy. Yay! He's like the Justin Bieber of the night. <laughs> Headlining the hottest barns. Shut up! It's a show you won't want to miss. I'm not going to be here forever. Maybe. <laughs> the Incredible Dr. Pole. New episodes Saturdays at 9 on Net Geo Wild. 
This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. So, what's good to read? And we mean really good to read right now. Well, that's where Charlie and Kate Gibson can help. Join us for the new podcast series. It is called The Bookcase with Kate and Charlie. We will make sure you love what you read. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. The Defense Department investigated a record number of UFO sightings in 2022. Might not be time to call the men in black just yet. Here's a look at what they are calling unidentified aerial phenomena, or UAP, by the numbers. 366 close encounters since March of 2021. That's the total number of UAP reported to the Pentagon's All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office. The previous 17 years combined had less than half of that many reported sightings. 63 of the cases turned out to be balloons or balloon-like entities. Six more were attributed to birds and debris like plastic bags. Another 26 were unmanned aircraft or drones. As for the other 171, the Anomaly Office can't really explain them, saying they demonstrated unusual flight characteristics and require further analysis. In 2021, the government released its first report on UFOs. Of those 144 reported sightings, officials found no evidence of extraterrestrial life or aircraft or weapons from foreign adversaries. Officials say this year's increase in reporting is partially due to a better understanding of the possible threats that UAP may represent either as flight safety hazards or potential national defense threats. And we still have a ton to get to here on Prime, how a personal fight for rapper Meek Mill just ended with the stroke of a pen. And who wants to be a billionaire? The historic Mega Millions jackpot. But first, a look at the top trending stories on abcnews.com. much happening these days it's hard to keep up things change hour by hour minute by minute the historic weather that's now unfolding the worries on wall street we're bringing you the right now at a nationwide teacher shortage the right now look at the day ahead an alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest story world news now and america this morning america's number one early morning news today does feel a little different early mornings on abc news live This is where I belong. This is home. Real dirt in the sunlight again. I'm very excited. Anything could happen at any moment. My heart is so happy right now. We're making magic. We're today. making magic. I think my niece, Allie, was pushed off that ledge. And only one person came into an eight-figure sum as a result of her death. If we pull this off, we're set for life. What do you think you're doing? Get out now. Can this be our little secret? They have to pay for what they did. The Watchful Eye, January 30th on Freeform and stream on Hulu. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show.
After nine months of detention, 35-year-old Taylor Dudley was released by Russian authorities at the Polish border into the arms of his mother, Shelley, and the team who had negotiated his freedom, including former New Mexico Governor Bill Richardson. The Michigan native and U.S. Navy veteran had traveled to Poland to attend a music festival, but then crossed into Kaliningrad, a small territory governed by Russia between Poland and Lithuania. The Russian news agency TASS reported that Dudley was charged with illegally crossing the border, but the case was dismissed without sentence. The Richardson Center saying, despite the current situation between our two countries, the Russian authorities did the right thing by releasing Taylor. A driver in California narrowly escaped being crushed to death after boulders on a rain-soaked hillside came crashing down. Mauricio Henao was on the Pacific Coast Highway in Malibu when he got a call from his girlfriend. He says she asked him to go back into the house for a bag she'd left behind. When he got there, he says he heard a loud noise followed by booms and crashing sounds. He looked outside and he saw a rock slide dumped boulders onto his car. Well, he says he feels Feels like he should play the lotto because he truly believes he was really lucky. Actor Kevin Spacey has pleaded not guilty to seven additional sex offenses in the UK, bringing the number of charges the Hollywood star faces across the pond to 12. The double Academy Award winner has already pleaded not guilty to charges that he sexually assaulted three men between 2004 and 2015. He now faces a dozen charges relating to four men between 2001 and 2013. His trial is due to start in June and last for three to four weeks. Spacey was granted bail and allowed to return to the United States after a preliminary hearing. Pennsylvania Governor Tom Wolf has pardoned rapper Meek Mill for gun and drug charges he faced in 2008, one of 369 pardons that Governor Wolf granted this week. In a statement, Wolf said each case deserves a second chance. Meek Mill thanked Wolf on Instagram and posted an image of the governor's pardon. A positive update about another baby, a baby giraffe that wasn't being fed by its mother in Australia. The unknown calf was born at Bernardo Safari Park from a 17-year-old giraffe named Tula back on January 5th. But for some reason, Tula didn't feed him for the first 24 hours, so the baby was taken to Adelaide Zoo so it could be hand-fed. Zookeepers there say he took to it, and they say he has five feeds a day, is doing very well, and they will name the calf in the next few weeks. Today's Mega Millions jackpot is making history, coming in at a whopping $1.35 billion. The drawing is the second largest Mega Millions jackpot in its history and the fifth largest jackpot ever. If you win and choose a cash option, it would amount to about $707 million, depending on where you live. Go on a vacation. Pay off a couple of mortgages. I would help my church. I would help my friends and family out. Your chances of winning the jackpot are just one in 302 million. Despite the low odds, ticket sales have skyrocketed. Lottery jackpots have been growing bigger in recent years. And as the prizes get bigger, the lines continue to grow. In a world of convenience, sometimes shaving, waxing, or going somewhere for laser hair treatment, can be anything but convenient. So what about those at-home laser hair removal devices showing up all over social media? Do they actually work? Our Becky Worley looked into it. Shave, wax, whoa. What if you could remove hair permanently at home? That's what at-home laser hair removal devices like these aim to do. And according to Good Housekeeping's Birner Arrow, It is definitely effective, but you need to put in the time. So they range from 8 to 12 weeks of continuous use and then use it as you need them for touch-ups, but you will see hair reduction. But we're talking about devices that shoot intense pulses of light at your skin. That's a little intimidating. So to try them out, I recruited my mom squad. And the conversation got real fast. I did the legs and I thought to myself, this would be a great thing to do on mute on a Zoom call. <laughs> It was much less painful than waxing, for sure, but you didn't get the immediate results. My husband was impressed. <laughs> I did some other parts that were a little bit more painful. <laughs> the chin was not bad. Once I learned how to get the automatic zap zap going, that was much faster. We chose Good Housekeeping's top-rated products in different categories. Their pick for best overall, the smooth skin, the silken, which they said was best for darker skin tones, the brawn, rated the fastest, the best cooling, a device from Kenzie, 
And Good Housekeeping said the best value was the nudes. What were the first zaps like? Like a rubber band snapping you. I jumped like the first time I did it. These devices target the dark pigment in hair, pulsing heat to damage the follicle so it can't grow back. To work, the hair has to be dark, and the devices can't safely be used by people with certain skin tones. Mine came with a, like, skin tone matching to, like, figure out. My skin is on the very darkest of their tones, and they said if you are not on this, then you shouldn't probably use it. And Good Housekeeping says that most devices have built-in sensors for determining what will work. We like the devices that have an automatic skin Color sensor, basically, we'll be able to look at the skin and uh, determine the amount of light intensity that needs to be applied to your skin based on your skin tone. And as for results, we use the devices for just eight weeks, but most manufacturers do recommend eight to 12 weeks. I saw thinner hair, especially in my armpits. How many actually saw a result? I did. A little bit. It was not as thick. I didn't see much results. I mean, I have particularly thick, coarse hair, so maybe I needed to do it more. And for Sarah, who has lighter hair... I didn't sense much result, but I think over time I would. I just think I wasn't as consistent as I would need to be. The consistency is what's going to drive the result. You know, there are just reasons that this is so easy. It's in the convenience of your home, when you want to do it. All right, Becky, thanks so much for that. And finally tonight, the NFL playoffs are upon us, and the brightest stars on the field are making sure they are dressed for success off the field. Trevor Alt introduces us to the man who just might be the NFL's go-to tailor. There's a saying in sports. Prescott fires, caught, lamb! Shaquan Barkley, touchdown Giants! Look good, feel good, play good. Just a teal interior with a 41 right there. Yeah, yeah. And for some of the best football players in the world, when they want to look good for the cameras, they call Tom Marcatelli. First and foremost, we got to talk about this. Can you get that coat from? Thomas the guy. Designer, Tom, from Gentleman's Playbook. Tom, Gentleman's Playbook. It's an all-star roster of clients. Tom says he works with about 350 professional athletes and counting 210 in the NFL. He says business is booming to the tune of a thousand custom-made suits a year. Number one suit guy in the league, Rob Gronkowski, 87. Thanks for making me the best dressed guy in football, Kyle Rudolph. Best suit guy in the game. Eric Hosmer. Do you find with athletes it tends to go one direction or the other? Either they want to look as good as possible or they don't care about it at all? Outstanding question. I would say there's some people that are, that are in the middle because there are a lot of guys that will buy just for their primetime games. And just like his suits, Tom's road to the world of high fashion was one of a kind. Outside of taking measurements, he's entirely self-taught, having started his career as an accountant. I was at a hedge fund for eight years, and any time I had a formal event, whether it was a wedding or if I'm taking my wife to dinner, I always wanted to be in a custom tailored suit. A little mango. I fell in love with the process of seeing these elaborate prints and these bold colors that I knew myself no one else was wearing. That inherent sense of style helped him burst onto the scene. He built a massive social media following serving as his own model. What's in your suit, Hall of Fame? Dak Prescott, NFL Honors 2020. It's the number one suit I've ever made. Why? Because of the color, because of how he wore it, because of the location. We were in Miami. Everything was perfect. Tom credits his success to a laser-focused attention to detail. He says he partners with the Los Angeles area company to get every suit tailored with pinpoint precision, and he personally interacts with every single client. I lay out all the fabrics, and I have them marked typically ahead of time. If, I'm, if it's someone I'm seeing for the first time, I won't have anything marked because I want to get a feel for their process and how what fabrics catch their eye. He knows these aren't your everyday suits. They are built to make a statement on the biggest stages. That's the coldest guy playing football right there. Take Joe Burrow's suit for last year's Super Bowl. Black and white, tiger striped, it set the internet on fire. My phone exploded on Twitter when he walked into the game in that suit with the hat with the glasses. I push the envelope because I, I know that my guys have the personality and the guts to pull off the most loud ones because I truly believe no matter how bold the print, it can be pulled off when it's tailored 
perfectly. Sometimes the turnaround is quick. He met Rob Gronkowski at a party days before the Super Bowl and offered to make him a suit in time for the game. He said, well, the game's in four days. How are you going to do it? I said, I'm going to measure you now. I'm going to have the suit done in 48 hours. And I actually had it done in 24 hours. He says his aim is for each suit to be a reflection of that player's personality. And many of them come with personalized hidden touches. No way. A grunt spike. Yes, sir. That's pretty dope. The result is a number of repeat clients. Oh, yeah. For Buccaneers tight end Kyle Rudolph, Tom made this special bomber suit ahead of his team's final regular season game. I made him a beige um, and brown houndstooth bomber suit with brown ribbing on it and on the inside lining. Our portfolio right there. Here's the, the top 10 fits of him, whether it's at award shows or just travel outfits. All different colored suits, all impeccably tailored. All right, Ben, here we go. And as word ben spreads Bailey. around the league, his client list keeps amazing. growing. Custom designed for? Ben Bredesen. Be it's beautiful. New York Giants lineman Ben Bredesen recently got his first suit. I've seen his logo around the locker room, and it's all been great stuff. I was in need of suits and asked around the locker room, and his name came up multiple times with great reviews. It's the perfect fabric because you have, you know, the textured blue, two-tone blue, and then the brown, which is just absolutely gorgeous. I mean, it's also perfect for fall, winter right now. He wanted something unique that was going to scream, hey, this was custom made for me. This isn't a plaid that you're going to go find anywhere in New York City or anywhere else. But also, it's still kind of tame. It's business. It's elegant. I wanted something I could wear multiple Multiple times, different events, and obviously for uh, for games. You're official now. Perfect. Thank welcome, you so welcome much. Welcome aboard. Thank you so much. And with the playoffs kicking off this weekend, Tom says he's ready to rise to the occasion too with some of his best and boldest fits so far. I have about 72 hours to execute each one of those plans because whoever wins this weekend, I got to start cooking up ideas. You got any suits being made today? Every day. Every day suits being made. Uh, I have half, at least half a dozen. Daniel Jones had me come and fit the Giants. All the offensive linemen, he had them pick a, a custom bomber jacket or a custom-made suit. What's the most satisfying part of the job? Seeing these guys walk in and me just saying, you know, I made that. And I'll never get tired of that. Some great designs. After seeing all of them, I'm kind of feeling like this light window pane is a bit lame. I don't know. Before we go tonight, the image of the day, President Biden welcoming Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida in the Oval Office. The meeting comes as Japan increases its military posturing amid concerns over China. That's our show for this hour. Stay with ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Phil Lipoff. Thanks for streaming with us. Coming up in our next hour, an alarming admission. School officials say they were warned a child might have a gun before he used it to shoot a teacher. And the region expected to see some major storms as the South recovers from a deadly tornado. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. The Biden classified document scandal Sunday morning. What will it mean for his presidency and how will it impact his classified documents case? Sunday morning, the powerhouse roundtable takes on two presidents under investigation on ABC's This Week. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. Always. Absolutely. That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby. It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. We're honored. ABC's 2020 winner of three Emmy Awards for Excellence. Thank you for making 2020 Friday night's most watched and most honored news magazine. Ready for a good show? 
I'm Phil Grucci of Fireworks by Grucci. Family owned, now in the sixth generation. The most spectacular fireworks this city has ever seen. But it has been a roller coaster ride. We had an explosion. It destroyed us. If it wasn't for the strength of the family, we would have never had decided to keep going. You either band together or you fall apart. And we're still here. I'm Phil Lipoff in for Lindsay Davis tonight. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We are monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. Air travel in the U.S. has almost returned to normal after a computer error caused the FAA to ground all domestic flights on Wednesday. More than a million travelers faced delays as the FAA says a database file was damaged by personnel who failed to follow procedures. They say the system is now functioning properly and cancellations yesterday were below 1%. A second caretaker has been arrested in the case of a missing four-year-old girl outside Oklahoma City. Athena Brownfield has been missing since Tuesday after a postal worker found her five-year-old sister wandering alone on the street. The husband and wife who are taking care of the two girls are in police custody, charged with child neglect. And it's about that time, the annual New Orleans Jazz Fest. Its lineup has been released. The artists include Lizzo, Ed Sheeran, John Baptiste, and Dead and Company. Among other headliners, festival organizers say there is something for everyone this year, from the delicious Southern cooking to a lineup of amazing artists, starting April 28th. All right, we're going to shift right now to the deadly tornado outbreak here in the U.S. The South bearing the brunt this time from the ferocious storms that have been pounding the West for weeks. Tonight, families are reeling from the damage, and our Steve Osinsami reports for us from outside Atlanta. More than 40 tornadoes have now been reported across seven states, including this one that tore through Selma, Alabama, where an initial damage survey tonight shows it was an EF2 with wind speeds of at least 111 miles an hour. They think the tornado that hit rural Otaga County minutes later was even stronger. This is what surviving the tornado looked like in Decatur, Alabama, where workers at a recycling facility took cover, and then a giant piece of metal came crashing down on an opening they couldn't close. At least nine people died in the storm in two states, including a five-year-old boy who was killed when his family's car was hit by a falling tree. The governors of both Georgia and Alabama have declared a state of emergency tonight, as many of their families are just now beginning to put their lives back together. Unfortunately, it's been a tragic night and morning in our state. As soon as the sun came up in Otaga County, Alabama, neighbors came out to help neighbors. Have you ever seen anything like this? Never. Never. On County Road 68, these are teachers and counselors from the middle school up the road who kept students safe during the storm. They're going to bring a tar. They were out today helping families pick up the pieces. So much damage. This will be our weekend for sure, probably part of next week also. Yeah. It's going to take a while to get all of this taken care of. The community center is collecting supplies. Yeah. Um, Boone's Chapel is feeding volunteers. Yeah. We're going to take care of our people. So many communities begin to take care of each other after devastating storms like this. Steve joins us now. Steve, how likely is it people will be able to get back into what's left of their homes? Well, people are already sort of sifting through, you know, what they have left of their homes. This one, for example, is a home that belongs to an older woman who survived. She's not able to stay here tonight, though, because there's no power to this home. And of course, is it's not really livable. So many people, though, have to first, of course, call FEMA. They have to call their insurance agents. Uh, they need help drying things out if their homes are livable. For many families, we're talking about weeks, but in some cases, we could be talking about months or years before people are actually able to truly get back into their homes just because of the various states of condition that some of these homes in, are in. And I want you to take a look around me and see this one. You know, this actually isn't even the worst of the worst. It looks like it's lost, you know, part of its roof. You see that, you know, the front of the home has 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 moved in, 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 in has fallen to the side here. 
but there are some homes that are complete and total losses. And so it's going to take those families a lot longer to rebuild. This here looks like they will probably have to rebuild this home. And, and one other thing that we heard, Phil, from different uh, people today, they're very concerned about supply chain issues, how long it's going to take them to get contractors, much less how long it's going to take them to deal with their insurance companies. Phil? Yeah, it's a long, difficult road to recovery. Steve, thank you so much. As that system moves out, another one is arriving in the west, and then it's heading east. ABC senior meteorologist Rob Marciano is tracking it for us. Rob? Hey, Phil, you know, the, the system that brought these deadly tornadoes to Alabama and Georgia was actually on the West Coast earlier in the week, bringing them floods and mudslides. And you're right, this next one coming into California will probably do a similar track. This one's big. It's got the flood watches that have been expanded, not just across most of California. We've seen that now for weeks, but all the way down south of San Diego. So heavy rain coming into all to the, to the Golden State, but also wind and rain coming up and through Oregon and Washington. And then a strong piece of this southern energy gets over the mountains we'll see heavy snows not just in the sierras but likely in the intermountain west as well and boy this time tomorrow night uh, san diego is really going to be getting clobbered and look how it holds together on monday morning into the midwest and then beyond that as it pushes all the way to the east coast but look at back to the california side of things another storm comes in monday morning that one's not too shabby either it's going to bring uh, several more inches of rainfall three to six plus total especially across Northern California and Central California. We've already seen this, the, the earth move and then the three to six feet of snow and a foot plus of snow in the Intermountain West, but three to six feet of more record setting snow in the Sierras. Uh, this is putting a nice dent in the drought. Uh, it's doing some damage while it does so, but look at the improvement we've seen uh, over the past few months. We went from extreme and exceptional drought to seeing none of that now in the last month, just some moderate drought in through parts of the Central uh, California coast. Now we really got to look at Utah and places like Colorado, get them to catch up and start to relieve some of that drought. But obviously getting it all at one time is, is not fun, Phil, and that's what's happening here. But the silver lining is we're seeing a, a nice uh, improvement, at least in California, in their drought. Yeah, Phil. nice to get something out of it. Rob, thank you so much. Now to the growing questions about classified documents found in President Biden's former office and his Delaware home. A second House committee has now opened an investigation into the matter. ABC senior White House correspondent Mary Bruce with details. Today, amid the firestorm over his handling of classified documents, President Biden welcoming the Japanese Prime Minister to the White House. The two discussed strengthening Japan's military might, deepening military cooperation between the two countries to counter the rise of China. But the White House agenda now overshadowed by questions about those classified documents found at the president's former private office and in the garage of his Wilmington home. 24 hours after the attorney general appointed a special counsel to investigate, the president today repeatedly refusing to comment further. Are you confident you did nothing wrong, Mr. President? The White House making it clear they're done talking about it. The president takes uh, classified information, classified documents very seriously. I would refer you anything that is related to this uh, to the, as it relates to the review to the Department of Justice or my colleagues at the White House Counsel uh, Office. In New York, former President Trump's legal troubles escalated today after a judge slapped his company, the Trump Organization, with the maximum penalty for a years-long scheme to evade taxes. ABC's Aaron Katursky with details. Tonight, the Trump Organization has been sentenced to the highest fine possible, $1.6 million, for what prosecutors called a multidimensional scheme to evade taxes. The victims of the public, the victims of the people of the state of New York, uh, and this kind of... Uh, pervasive fraud. The judge said it, we said it, and the jury found it. It's greed, pure and simple. The conviction stained former President Trump's namesake company as he runs again for the White House. For well over a decade, the jury found it paid executives off the books through luxuries like rent, car leases, and private school tuition. Former President Trump was never charged, but at sentencing, prosecutors said elements of the scheme were explicitly sanctioned from the top down. And at trial, jurors saw Trump's signature on checks and his initials on memos. The defense insisted Trump did not know about the scheme and in a statement called the former president a victim of politically motivated prosecutors. Aaron joins us now. And Aaron, I'm curious, does this complete the investigation into Trump's business practices or is there more to come? 
There may be more to come, Phil. The district attorney told us that this sentencing here at court closes one chapter of his ongoing criminal investigation of former President Trump. So that suggests there may yet be another chapter to write. In the meantime, the Trump Organization has two weeks to pay the fine, and the company says it is going to appeal its conviction. Phil? All right, Aaron Katursky, thank you. Now to a shocking admission from school officials in Virginia where police say a six-year-old boy shot his teacher. We are learning the superintendent told parents the same day of the shooting the child's backpack had been searched because someone alleged he had a weapon, but nothing was found. ABC's chief justice correspondent Pierre Thomas has details for us tonight. Tonight, a stunning admission from school and police officials in Newport News, Virginia. Just hours before a six-year-old student opened fire on his teacher, a staffer was warned the boy might be armed with a gun. At least one administrator was notified of a possible weapon and was aware that there was a potential that a weapon was on campus. In a virtual town hall obtained by Wavy TV, the superintendent telling families when the first grader arrived late for school, someone reported he might have a weapon, but a search of his backpack turned up nothing, and police say they were not alerted. A few hours later, the boy shot his teacher with his mother's 9 millimeter pistol. It was taken out of a book bag and concealed on his person, and after recess, it was pointed and fired. 25-year-old Abby Zwerner was shot in the hand and chest and is still hospitalized in stable condition. Police say she saved lives that day. That young lady stopped, got those kids out of that room and stopped while she had suffered a gunshot wound and turned around to make sure those kids were safe. Pierre joins us now. Pierre, the school acknowledges it was warned the boy might have a weapon. His backpack was searched. So how was the gun missed? Phil, so we don't know how school officials missed that gun. We don't know if they patted the boy down, searched his pockets, or if the gun was somehow hidden. And we also don't know if they called the boy's parents when they were told he might have a gun feel. Mm. All right, Pierre Thomas, thank you. Overseas tonight in Ukraine, Russia is declaring victory in the bloody battle for the key town of Solidar. But Ukraine is denying the claim. ABC's Matt Gutman on the ground for us in Ukraine. Tonight, Russia making its strongest claim yet of controlling the town of Solidar in eastern Ukraine, the war's bloodiest battle. But the Ukrainian soldiers still fighting inside the town, disputing that, showing Russian soldiers amassing, then being targeted, a fireball, the result of a direct hit. Not in dispute, the destruction. The city of Bakhmut now almost unrecognizable. Ukraine says this footage shows a drone zeroing in on Russian troops. They scurry inside the barn. That munition dropped, the barn exploding in a flash of flame and smoke. Ukraine claiming up to 20,000 Russian troops. Many of the mercenaries have been killed in the region. Ukraine hasn't made public its casualty figures. And perhaps in a sign of growing frustration with the war's progress, President Putin this week publicly scolding a senior minister, criticizing him for working too slowly on contracts for new aircraft. Matt joins me now. And Matt, those, those casualty numbers you're talking about are just horrifying. What does it mean if Russia takes this small town? It's unclear, Phil, right? Because on the one hand, the military value of Solidar is questionable, as is Russia's tactics here. They have thrown an enormous amount of resources at this city, and it may come at such a high cost. Uh, Ukraine is talking about uh, 10 up to 20,000 casualties on the Russian side, that it may prevent Russia from taking the main prize in the region, which is the city of Bakhmut, and that is that would give it the control of uh, part of eastern Ukraine. So right now, it's unclear what it actually means, what is unmistakable, is the enormous toll on both sides. Phil. No, absolutely. Matt Gutman from Ukraine tonight. Matt, thank you. And still to come after weeks of bloody clashes and unrest, a show of peace in Peru. And a tale of rescue, love, and self-discovery set in the Amazon rainforest. The subject of a documentary tells us how she's helping to create a blueprint for rehabilitating animals hurt by deforestation. I love the true crime community because I can make a difference. Police found a skull in a bucket of cement. We're at a dead end. So law enforcement turned to the public. I was obsessed. This was one that I had to solve. I got a phone call of you sitting down. This is why I take blood pressure medicine. Holy crap. 
My motto is go big or go home. Web of Death. Only on Hulu. Bring your friends. Bring them all. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. not the most current dance, but I do it really well. The first time I've been in a place that I love doing something that I love. With people that you love? No, I didn't say that. Come on, y'all, make some noise. Yeah! I'm Turk Janine. Janine. Gregory. Um, Ava. Ava's here. Sorry, I don't speak line. Ready for a good show? I'm Phil Gucci of Fireworks by Gucci. No matter how big, no matter how small, it is dangerous. It's not a paycheck, yeah. it's our life. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. We are tracking several headlines around the world at this hour. South Korea and U the U.S. held a joint military drill near the inter-Korean border, mid heightened tensions with North Korea. More than 800 troops were involved in the exercise to train with AI technology and other weapon systems. The drill comes with growing fear that the North could test another nuclear weapon. In Peru, thousands protested peacefully against their new government following weeks of violence after former President Pedro Castillo was driven from power. At least 42 people have died over the past several weeks with growing calls for the new president to resign. And in Bali, the Indonesian Navy rescued 43 endangered green sea turtles after coming across poachers while they were out at sea. The population of green turtles, one of the largest sea turtles, has been in a significant decline in recent years. Tonight, back here at home, a spotted leopard is safe and sound after it went missing from the Dallas Zoo after what authorities claim was an intentional act. It sparked a day-long search, and just a short time ago, the Dallas Zoo tweeted the cat Nova was found within zoo grounds after someone apparently cut the fence of the leopard's enclosure. My next guest is an ecologist and founder of the organization that aims to preserve the Amazon rainforest as well as protect and rehabilitate the wildlife that is there. It's a mission chronicled in the Amazon Prime documentary, Wildcat. Take a look. I'm in this most beautiful place in the world. And I can't be happy. And then I met Sam. That's when my life really took a turn. This is Keanu, our ocelot rescue. He will be reintroduced into the wild in a year and a half. I didn't know if it was going to be doable. Their alternative is living a life in the zoo or dying in a much worse way. Okay, I was sold at Baby Keanu. Um, oh, Nueva founder Samantha Swicker joins us now. Samantha, it's so good to see you. Thanks for taking the time to be with us. Of course, thanks for having me. This is an intimate look at your work rescuing and rehabilitating key species in the wildlife in Peruvian Amazon. Tell us how this whole thing started and how did you end up in Peru? Well, I ended up in Peru because I always wanted to study elusive species and keystone species, like you said. Um, so I did an internship. It kind of led to exploring Las Piedras, which is a very important but unprotected region. And I started Oja Nueva in 2015, and it's grown greatly. And with the help of this film, we'll, we'll hopefully be able to grow even more. Your documentary focuses on two ocelots named Keanu and Khan, we just kind of saw there in the clip, as well as your partnership with Harry Turner. Harry is a, a former British soldier struggling with PTSD who, in trying to rehabilitate Keanu, tries to find healing in that, which is lovely. Um, how did the idea for this film come about? Um, well, honestly, when we first got Khan, um, 
you know, we weren't a rescue center. We were just trying to do what was right for one individual wild cat. And we looked for our resources. We talked to a couple of biologists, specialists who said, you know, the best option is do it yourselves. And here's a couple of tips, but it hasn't been done before. So, you know, document it. And so um, I kind of invested in some camera gear and we tried to document it the best we possibly could so that potentially other people could do something similar in the future. And um, then we met the filmmakers maybe two years after that. And what was supposed to be a short documentary about Khan's life turned out to be a feature length film as soon as we found Keanu. Uh, we, we have a clip here with Keanu. Let's take a look. <laughs> this little dude is Keanu. And he is our second ocelot rescue. He will be reintroduced into the wild in about a year and a half, and he will be a very aggressive wild cat. So we learn a lot about some of the challenges in rewilding ocelots. Uh, before we get into the particulars, talk about ocelots for a minute. Yeah, so ocelots are, they're relatively understudied. We do know a little bit more about them than we do margays or jaguarundis, for example, but they are a miso predator. They're actually in the mid range. We have five wild cats in the region of Las Piedras and they're right in the middle. So they're around maybe 35, maximum 40 pounds. It's a pretty big cat, so the size of a dog. Um, they're mostly nocturnal, crepuscular. They eat you know, anything from rodents to reptiles. And I mean, they're a hyper carnivore. They're a very, very successful predator. What about the, the behavior, say, the, the, the interaction, the relationship between ocelots and humans and you? Um, yeah, well, I mean, in the film, you see a relationship between Harry and Keanu and we actually don't, so we don't use that type of uh, management anymore. We've rescued and, and released six wildcats since Keanu and we have 20 cats in our care and it's just, I mean, we've we've come to realize the importance of their enclosures and really just modifying um, their kind of captive environment to be as wild as possible and really just relying on the natural environment to do that. So we've really minimized our human contact. Um, you can see such like a strong relationship in the film and we've, we've realized with time that that relationship, we should really start to break off around four months. Um, it's hard when you receive baby cats because I mean, baby animals in general, they need love, they need attention. Um, they, you can kind of sense it, they need a, a reason to, to live. You mentioned Harry, I want to talk a little bit about that. Harry's a veteran we mentioned who struggles with his mental health as a result of his tour in Afghanistan. Uh, rehabilitating Keanu uh, and being in the Amazon seems to give Harry a sense of peace. Uh, how did that work? How was that relationship? I think, you know, it's it's similar to a lot of people. It's similar to myself. You know, he came to the Amazon for a purpose, which was to find a higher purpose, something else to to focus on, to give him, you know, a reason to live in the beginning. And and in the beginning, he really was the, the you know, the best candidate for raising a wild cat. It's something that takes a number of years. You know, you have a wildlife rehabilitation specialist now, like on our team, you have to dedicate a year and a half, two years of your life to these animals. And not a lot of people are willing to do that or were willing to do that at this time. Samantha, thank you so much. And I think thank you for opening our eyes to something that, you know, not everybody is is focused on. It's, it's important work. I really do appreciate it. The documentary Wildcat is now streaming on Amazon Prime Video. Thank you for having me. And still to come, how would you like the keys to happiness? An author and psychiatrist breaks down decades of studies on how to have a better life. Come out, come out, wherever you I are. think my niece, Allie, was pushed off that ledge. And only one person came into an eight-figure sum as a result of her death. If we pull this off, we're set for life. What do you think you're doing? Get out now. Can this be our little secret? They have to pay for what they did. The Watchful Eye, January 30th on Freeform and stream on Hulu. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast. Now streaming on ABC News Live. The Biden classified document scandal Sunday morning. What will it mean for his presidency and how will it impact his classified documents case? Sunday morning, the powerhouse roundtable takes on two presidents under investigation on ABC's This Week. 
Zoo. 200. Oh, 200. 200 episodes of Dr. Paul. Oh. Music to my ears. It's been 10 years, and I'm still having the fun. That rocks. He's got the moves that make your animals groove. Now we do the dance of joy. Yay. He's like the Justin Bieber of the music. <laughs> Headlining the hottest barns. Cut out. It's a show you won't want to miss. I'm not going to be here forever. Maybe. <laughs> the Incredible Dr. Paul. New episodes Saturdays at 9 on Net Geo Wild. Welcome back, and here's a question for you tonight. Do you want to learn how to live the good life? Dr. Bob Waldinger may just have the key to doing so. Dr. Waldinger is a professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. He co-wrote a new book called The Good Life, Lessons from the World's Largest Scientific Study of Happiness, which studied three generations for eight decades. Dr. Waldinger, good to see you. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. I almost feel like you do have the key. That smile on your face looks like you have found the good life. <laughs> Let's get into it and talk about it. The National Institute of Mental Health estimates roughly 19 million adults in the U.S. had at least one episode of major depression in 2019. And of course, the COVID-19 pandemic increased anxiety and depression by about 25 percent globally. That's according to the World Health Organization. So how can Americans not only combat the depression that they might be feeling, but actually see the signs and get ahead of it? Well, what we found in this 85-year study of the same families is that the people who stayed healthiest, both emotionally and physically, were people who had better connections with other people. So what we find is that if people really build and pay attention to their relationships with others, they can weather some of the storms, some of the mental health storms, some of the physical storms, pandemics, that all of these crises are things that we need other people to help us get through. To that end, you write in the book, I'll quote it for, for our viewers, uh, our social life is a, is a living system and it needs exercise. Uh, so why is our social fitness just as important as our physical fitness, to sort of piggyback off what you were just talking about? Well, we find when we look at all these lives that it really matters having other people to decompress with, to deal with stressors, to support you, uh, to have fun with, that all of those things are, are brought to us by our connections with other people. And so we also find that the isolated and lonely people are the people who have not just less happy lives, but whose health breaks down sooner. Yeah, this study seems to back up that phrase, you can't go it alone. Um, you developed a quiz in collaboration with the New York Times to determine just how strong one's relationships are. So what are some necessary boundaries we can, steps we can take to keep up a healthy relationship with our family and friends, these relationships that you say are so important to our health? Well, one of the things we can do is make sure we touch base frequently. I mean, many of us have so much pressure on us, the pressures of home life and work life, that it's easy to say, oh, I'll, I'll reach out to those friends and families later. There will be time for that. And what our study says is do it now. Do little things today, every week reach out to someone with a text, with an email, suggest that you go for a walk or have coffee, that all of those things are small steps we can take to build that bedrock of relationship well-being. In the book, you say there's hope in relationships and life, despite never-ending conflict in the world that we see every day. You write, global crises will continue to impact our collective well-being, but as we struggle with how to confront these challenges, we must remember that every one of us has only the moment before us in the place we stand. Uh, you know, that sounds very much like live in the moment, uh, you know, experience what you're living in. Explain. Well, what we found was that many of our study participants went through the Great Depression, World War II, the upheavals of the Vietnam era. And when we asked them, how did you get through these things? Almost to a person, they said, it was my relationships. It was family, friends. It was fellow soldiers if I was in the war. That each of these things is something we can cope with, including pandemics. We can cope with them by 
making sure that we pay attention to the people we want to stay connected with. It takes maintenance. I, I had lunch with a good friend and colleague uh, yesterday, and she said, live a deliberate life. Yeah. Be very deliberate about what you do. Just don't let the wind take you where you want to go. Um, I'm looking forward to finishing the book. I really do appreciate your time, Dr. Wagner. Thank you so much uh, for being here with us. You can purchase The Good Life Lessons from the world's largest scientific study of happiness wherever books are sold. And this important note, if you feel your depression is severe or if you are experiencing suicidal thoughts, please do consult a doctor immediately or seek help at the closest emergency room. Also, the National Suicide Prevention Line is 1-800-273-8255, and there will always be there someone there to talk with you. That's our show for tonight. Stay with ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Phil Lipoff. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Ready for a good show?